So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay in the tournament. And we begin with the first of the semi finals here between Alexios22 and Batu, who went into this as ranked one. They had the most impressive performances in the group stages of the Swiss style tournament. And they are going to be facing off against the team which I believe were ranked fourth, um, and that is going to be Tundra's Fox and Waffles. So, let's get this show on the road with the compositions first and foremost, and we'll start off with the blue team. We're going to be seeing this from the perspective of Alexios and his ally Batu here. Um, just from a cursory glance, they haven't gone for the dual ballista that they've been going for in the vast majority of the replays that we've seen from them uh, throughout the tournament over the course of the past month or so. Uh, month, Well, I guess two months at this point, actually. Um, but... Uh, Alexios still has one over here. Playing as Imladris, they have gone for typically one Elven faction and then one supporting faction as well, so they definitely have a bit of a game plan in mind. The Ballista here for Imladris is an interesting call for an Elven force as well compared to their allies, because of course uh, artillery is expensive and Elven armies are expensive to field, generally speaking. Relatively small. On the arena map you do have a bit more terrain, but still the relatively small size of the Elves does mean you are in a bit of a constant state of worrying about being outmaneuvered, so he is going to need to be careful here. Elder Runway Archers will, of course, give you that all-round presence with some really good ranged damage, as well as being good in melee as well, but there is only one unit of them. Elder Runway are very expensive, so you do need to support them properly. That's exactly what a unit like the Spears of Rivendell can be used for. Of course, in a field battle, their anti-cavalry capabilities will come into it a little bit more, perhaps, than they would in a siege battle, though they are still a good line holding unit as well, albeit they wield their weapon a bit more aggressively than they have in the past now. Imladris Guardians are expensive, especially when they're armoured up like this, but they do represent a very strong front line. Very typical in these pitch battles to have a long weapon unit backed up by a shielded, uh, more close combatant style unit, but of course for the Elves they have uh, more expensive options in this regard if you want it to be truly solid, um, and there aren't as many of them, so you can only cover so much, but the terrain over on this side maybe does favour that. Second unit of Elder Runway Archers is an expensive pick to go for, but it does give them a real presence at long range in the trees over here, which they will be hiding away. The Gwaiti Rock Door, they can be used a bit more aggressively without the General in the unit. It's not such an, a bad thing if the Elves lose their General as some of the other factions, they are made of sterner stuff mentally. But you still don't want your General to fall, especially in this new version of the game, the loss of a General is a bit more of a sting than it would otherwise be, the Gwaiti Rock Door. Still, I believe, the most, the best all-round unit of Lance Cavalry that the game has to offer. Uh, very, very good, but very, very expensive. Similar story with the Elder Runway Swordmasters, actually. They'll be very effective in close melee, very good at dealing damage, very good at keeping themselves alive with the armor and the melee defense as well, which they will need to be because of their expense and because there are only just over 100 of them per unit. A real theme going on here with the Imladris Force and the God Helim an even heavier unit than the Imladris Archers, very very strong of course, shielded as well, the very best of Imladris's Archers, so a small um, force here, there is actually some more cavalry over here as well. These standard Lancers have been very effective for teams in this tournament so far on the open field, but Elder Runway Lancers, more of these Elder Runway, I mean it is a small army, it is elite, it can be very effective. He's going to need his ally to really provide the numbers here, and that's something that Arthur Dane can certainly do. They've got a good rank and file force. Arthur Dane spearmen combined with the first level of armor upgrade on the Arthur Dane pikemen to give them their breastplates. Good anti cavalry, good at holding the line, but most importantly, of course, to help offset the quality that the elves have brought. Numerous. Just in behind, however, Arthur Dane are not without quality themselves. The defenders of Fornos may not be as strong as the Elder Enway equivalent that Imladris have brought, even with their heavy plate armor, but they will fill much the same sort of role, um, and they will be capable of doing a good amount of damage to the right kinds of units on the opposition side of things. More cavalry as well from Arthur Dane with their Dunedain cavalry over here. You can see that it's a new unit as well, throwing Axeman, and um, just in general as well it will give them that nice anti-cavalry cavalry force which can be very important when it comes to seizing control on an open field like this. More expense though, we did see this in the playoff game and used to good effect for Arthur Dane there. Both units of high-end heavy cavalry, Knights of Anubinus, they don't have maybe quite the same sort of finesse up close and personal 
that the uh, Guaiti Rock Door do, but they are very, very effective tanks on horseback as well, when you consider their plate armour and the big shields that they carry also. Royal Court of House Arm Lathe may be a little bit less well-rounded, but they will still be very devastating off the charge. Not quite as expensive as the Enuminous Brethren that they're going to be running with here, um, but put together, when they're moving as one, it doesn't really make a great difference which one of them actually hits you. Um, the defenders are Fornost as well, so more standard lancers. I mean, certainly in terms of fast movers and high tier fast movers as well, the blue team have got a lot of them, but time will tell whether that proves to be the right call. Meanwhile, over here on this side, the red team starting off with Waffles playing as Umbar. Corsairs on the front line, of course, not seeing anything this low tier from the opposition. They're very, very numerous. They're not likely to be able to kill much um, in melee on their own, but just the numbers here, I think, will be a bit of a boon for the red team, because it's one area where they're almost certain to have a pretty clear advantage, certainly in terms of infantry. The Warlords of Umbar over here, as well as the Alcarondas Faithful, so again, both uh, going for both of the bodyguards here. Cavalry here, very expensive, um, but I think it's actually the right call, knowingly or not, just to be used a little bit more defensively, perhaps, from an Umbar perspective, because of the danger that the Arthur Dane and Imladris Cavalry does pose to them. Corsair Blackguards could be very, very important as well. They need to be careful not to get zoned out by the Elven Archers in particular. But if they do get up close and personal, just a few volleys is all it takes, really, to maybe put the battle beyond the numbers of infantry that the blue team have at their disposal here. They can also be very effective at uh, really doing a lot of damage to cavalry up close, should the need arise also. Heavy damage coming from the Umbar Axe Guard. They may lack the finesse that some of the units on the other side of the field have, um, but they're very numerous, not quite as elite, of course, either as the units across from them, but that armor piercing, that damage, it is going to be very, very helpful for them in conjunction with the numbers that they do have. And then over here, the centerpiece, really, of the Umbar Force, standard Belagai pikemen, the more impressive Naran Aru Sentinels. Of course, those shields could prove to be a problem for the high-tier Elven Archers, and then the Alcarondas Legion here in numbers as well, the heart of the Umbar Infantry Force. They won't go quietly into that good night here, Umbar, with their quality that they have up close, another unit of the Narunaru Sentinels as well, um, but we'll see. We also have the Trebuchet. I mean, it is an interesting call, this, considering it is quite common for people in this tournament so far to have brought ballistas. I think Waffles himself um, was on the receiving end, actually, of some ballista play earlier on in the tournament, I believe, if my memory serves correctly, but the Trebuchet is potentially more damaging. Their chances of hitting something against smaller forces like this are maybe a little bit more limited. The crew itself could be useful, however. Again, armor piercing and uh, certainly no shrinking violets in melee. And then moving on, we have Rohan. Of course, they are on the receiving end of a loss in the playoffs, but we'll see if Tundra's Fox has more luck with them here. The Dwarven Catapult we saw, but it wasn't really um, all that useful on the last occasion. But I think on this occasion, we're gonna see maybe a little bit more of a slower opening, in which case the double artillery here um, for the red team could well be very, very useful. Of course, Rohan are going to have more numbers in melee than in Ladris. They will suffer when it comes to a one-on-one -on -one fight, but if Rohan have anything about them here, they should endeavor to make sure that that is never going to be the case. The Westmark infantry are good quality, of course, but if you put them in a straight-up fight with a unit of Elder Anway, they will lose, so it needs to not be a straight-up fight, essentially. More throwing projectiles, though, from the shield mains. This is one area on foot where maybe the red team, if it comes down to the late game when the blue team have not set up a an engagement that really suits them, the throwing axes and the javelins here that the red team have available to them could be absolutely vital. Helm hammers, good armor piercing damage, again will be useful even against Imladris, but we'll see if it can really go toe to toe with the best that the elves have to offer today. More west marks, more shield mains, I'd be surprised if there weren't more Rohan units skulking around in the trees. Unsurprisingly I'm sure we see the sons of Aeol and then a huge cavalry force here on the flank as well. I mean, with these numbers, Rohan could make it a bit uncomfortable for the cavalry heavy force that the blue team have opposite them, but I mean, the blue team would have known what Rohan were on the field, and this was always going to be a possibility, if not likely, with the Riddermark skirmishes here. And then some Eastmark horse archers in addition to some red shields and more Eastmark horse archers on the other side. So good skirmishing cavalry here, good artillery as well. So I think the blue team maybe have the higher ceiling with their quality, but I think in terms of early game comfort based on the compositions, the red team will be feeling pretty good about things initially. We'll see though as we get this battle underway. 
basically the Dwarven Catapult already firing away, the Trebuchet as well. If you're going to hit infantry, you probably be most likely to hit Arthurdain, but of course the real prize may end up being a square hit into one of those Elven units, because there's a lot of value that you can score very, very quickly. The Ballista may be placed on counter-artillery rolls, although that's not quite the easy task for this kind of unit that it was in the past. Some of the crew getting killed off and one of them burning almost immediately. That is pretty unfortunate from an elven perspective. It's certainly the sort of thing where like the dwarves will probably continue to try and knock this artillery down because it's the only super long range threat really that they have. And one ballista immediately burning and crumbling. Ballista damage 99%. Now, going after them with both artillery units, because of course if you can kill off this ballista, even if it isn't as efficient as it once was, you are still pretty likely to then be able to dictate the long range game as you please, and like I said, the blue team have got limited options in that regard. They can come forward with their elven archers, but they will need to get a little bit closer to do that, and if you are going to go about things in that way, you're going to have to trust in your cavalry play to try and counteract the high-end Dunbar forces and the sheer numbers that Rohan have at their disposal and at that point it becomes who can hold their nerve and it's not a fight I think the blue team would have been too eager to engage themselves in but if that was the case I'm surprised they didn't go for the classic two ballista approach that this team has done in the past in this tournament anyway Ooh, and the catapult deciding to change target and that was a fortuitous hit but a good hit on those elder and my archers there and that is a good amount of value scored almost immediately it's a more high risk composition this certainly from the elves and unfortunately for them I think they, they can't simply stay here they're either going to need they're moving backwards by the looks of things but it's certainly better than just sort of sticking around and waiting to find out what fate befalls them if they remain the problem is the elves can pull back temporarily, but if the artillery advantage remains for the red team, they can simply shift their artillery forward and start bombarding them again, and try and get as much value as they possibly can out of that artillery before then moving forwards. After all, they won't really want to engage in just a straight-up melee fight. Umbar probably have the ability to do so with their composition, but Rohan certainly don't. They can try and skirmish with those horse archers, but that'll only get them so far. It's the softening up process of the artillery here and another ballista falls I mean as if it were in any doubt really based on how the initial shots went and the compositions were set up the artillery duel is going to be won by the reds <clears throat> and that is a real problem I mean they can try and use up as much of the bolts as they can and they may as well because trying to move the ballista out of harm's way at this point is just going to result in the classic medieval 2 spinning on the spot they're not going to be able to move. You could argue that the crew itself is actually worth saving at this point, although to be fair, the Ballista has managed to inflict something of a loss on the Red Team with one of the Dwarven Catapult burning, and it won't be lasting too much longer, but... In the Trebuchet... Well, actually, no, the Trebuchet. Both Trebuchets have also been destroyed. I completely missed that. So it's entirely possible, actually, that the blue team could end up winning the artillery duel. I mean, the ballista ever the reliable artillery to artillery fight. But, I mean, it's been quite a while, actually, since we've seen artillery in this way, anyway, be this devastating. I mean, both sides now going for the flaming shot. More damage being done. Certainly more collateral damage has been done by the red team artillery and in the end that may actually be the most significant contribution that these guys can make one thing I will say as well is the artillery crews for the red team are more significant units in the grand scheme than the elven one interestingly the dwarven catapult now simply trying to do a bit of extra damage now Forward come the Royal Courthouse Armleith. I mean, not a huge archer presence from either side, really. I mean, Imladris have the most on foot, certainly. Rohan have plenty of horse archers and horseback javelins. 
I wish I had Numenor coming forwards. I mean, getting a charge on them wouldn't be the end of the world, but I mean, you'd have to go into the lion's den in order to truly be able to get any sort of value off. I'll just keep an eye on that. Warlords of Umbar heading over to the flank to maybe put some pressure on the Knights of Fornos, but you can see on the mini map that the Arthur Danians immediately pulling back. Damage 50%, damage 38. I mean, against the odds, I suppose, given how the initial engagement was going. Ballista will win out. There's a lot of value. I mean, who's truly come out better from that? I suppose it depends really on how much the Ballista can do afterwards. Like I said, the infantry units themselves may end up being more significant late on. It's another strong unit of more heavily armoured troops than Rohan typically traffics in as well. Another direct hit. I don't know if that's going to be the final arcing catapult shot. The fact they got some hits on some Elder Enway will certainly assuage any fears that ultimately losing the artillery duel by the looks of things will have any lasting impact. Both sides content to let this play out as it will though. Neither side as a result of this is willing to commit anything too significant yet. Extra pressure could be applied with archers, but if Imladris move forward, they don't really have the numbers to cover themselves, especially not against that Rohiric swarm. Going for it again. The fortuitous hits for the opposition artillery have certainly dried up, so the elves. It's not a devastating amount of losses, but it's just how small the Elven army is in general. It's still making me a little bit leery. All of this, the catapult moving forwards a little bit more. What's it going for, you wonder? Some of the Arthedanian cavalry over here. I mean, the Arthedanian infantry is still a little bit further back. There's this sort of expeditionary force of elves further forwards, but both sides will be paying extra attention to how their opponents are moving, so they will have noticed those spears of Rivendell move into place. The Ballista changing the target to go after the Shield Maidens now. Cavalry probing the line still. It's a tentative opening here. I think both sides were maybe hoping that the artillery would be a little bit more decisive. I don't think either side will be that pleased with how that went. If you're going to invest the money to bring a Catapult and a Ballista between two teams, you want to have the extreme long range advantage and then you can all your opponents all over the place really with the cavalry as well. From a blue team perspective though, the ballista looking like it may very well be out of ammunition. So now the question is what now? Both sides have traded blows with artillery and neither side has really gained much. The thing is for the red team when they start moving forward they will need to stay moved forward because of the firepower of those heavy Imladris archers. When it comes to a straight skirmish fight, the Rohirrim horse archers are fairly numerous, but you back the elves there with the damage and the defensive nature of them, and horse archers, of course, being less numerous means it's more of a straight-up shooting contest, and that's not something you really want to get involved with an elf as such. Still good cavalry around as well, Arthur Dane bringing good amount of cav themselves. Arthur Dane and Rohan maybe having similar designs on the battle in that regard. Rohan still yet to see any of their units reveal themselves from hiding at the moment I believe. Still maneuvering. I mean let's not forget in pretty much every instance so far except for that playoff actually where both sides move forward almost from the off essentially and it became a bit of a mosh pit early on we have seen a very clear dynamic between those being a little bit more aggressive and those being a little bit more passive and in every instance of that happening the aggressor has been the one to win out but you have to set that up first before you do it simply charging across the field is not going to suffice and i think both sides realize that the red team charge in, they won't be able to manoeuvre with their cavalry to the extent that will let them do that damage, and they'll end up getting stuck in a fight against some quality infantry while getting shot by elven archers, whereas the blue team, if they move forward, they won't have the numbers to be able to both blanket the front line with the numbers they need, 
and cover their backs against the cavalry, cover their fronts really against the throwing projectiles. Both sides have the ability to deal a lot of damage from afar. I think by the time the melee engagement gets fully set, we'll already have a pretty clear idea about who's going to win out here. I mean, this could be an interesting moment to gain a little bit of an advantage in the cav fight. These defenders of Fornos look like they're going to be caught by the Alcaron Das Faithful. They just about get away. They dodged the charge there, which is fortunate for them, because I still don't know if they're actually going to be able to get away here. They're going to try and bisect. I, I really don't think they'll be able to get away. Um, and of course, against both of Umbar's bodyguard tier cavalry, as much as standard lancers are now a little bit more useful, um, they are certainly going to take more losses here and now getting picked apart with no response. That's the first damage we've seen inflicted by melee weaponry in this battle so far. Any non-mechanical weaponry, in fact. And it's not the end of the world, it's certainly not decisive, but these small margins are how the table gets laid for later incursions. Still a good deal of distance between the two sides. I mean, this is the map which maybe promotes the most amount of manoeuvring simply because there's a little bit more terrain. Where you choose to fight is pretty important when it comes to having any sort of success in this particular arena. Quite a few rock doors still. I don't know if the catapult still has ammunition. By the looks of things, no. I'm pushing it around, but it was just for show, it seems. Skirmishers. That's another throwing projectile unit. The only real throwing projectile unit the blue team have are those throwing axemen on horseback. The angle might help them there, though. I mean, the clearest target, surely, for them will be all of Umbar's pikemen. It's the most significant anchor on the field today, even with the Arthurdanians and their own pikes, the level here on display from... We are going to land a charge here. This is risky, though, from the Knights of Fornos, because as soon as they do so, the pikes are going to come rolling in. They do land that charge, though, and kill off a decent number of the Corsairs, but a few riders fall away as well, and... Oh, yeah, that was maybe a little bit bold from Batu. Maybe would have been more worthwhile to take a risk like that if it was a unit of genuine quality you were going after, but it was only a unit of Corsairs, so... I mean, they should return from routing those Knights of Fornos, but that's more damage done to the Cav. Again, another very minor melee engagement which the red team can take a decent amount of heart from. I mean, do nine troll slayers revealing themselves? That's a good throwing projectile unit that's revealed itself from hiding. Very potent up close and from afar with those spears. Certainly very multifaceted. Do nine cavalry moving forward. Now the Elder Runway archers are starting to fire, and the question now is what are the red team going to do? They turn their backs on those Elder Runway, they're going to take huge swathes of damage very quickly. If they move forward though, they can engage, and it's not the easiest angle for the archers, not even the easiest angle really for throwing projectile units, but it's certainly going to be the sort of thing which can do a lot of damage very quickly, and this is where we're going to start to see levels of damage far more significant than what we've seen already. More Westmark units revealing themselves in the trees, and I mean, it's now or never. I think the manoeuvring from the blue team there was pretty damn good. Despite that initial charge maybe not being quite so great from the cavalry, the situation that has arisen from it, with Umbar's infantry being further forward is more in their favour, I would suggest, than a few of the others. Ranges of Castamere revealing themselves, that's a good amount of damage potential. Eastmark Horse Archers, I mean, all of the Rohirrim Horse Archers now getting chased off by the Dunedain Cavalry. Now, now is the most significant time in the battle, actually, with the Elven Archers trying to do more damage to the Rohirrim Horse Archers, who are now in retreat. They will do damage to the Elves and the Dunedain in response, but more significant damage will be heading their way, you would suggest. The most significant thing that may arise from all of this is the arrival of Rohirrim reinforcements. Meanwhile, Elderunway Lancers 
do charge in. They do land a good charge, but I mean, it's on spearmen and cheap spears as well, so it's not the end of the world for Rohan. I know Zelda my Lance is already wavering as a result, being in melee with spears and being hit up close by javelins and the Sons of Aeol are in here, which, as much as the Elder Runway Lancers are a good quality unit of Elven Cavalry, the Sons of Aeol, the very best that the Rohirrim have to offer. Rohan are going to need to crunch in from the side, though, you would suggest, although Eastmark Spearmen more throwing projectiles as well, Westmark Spearmen revealing themselves. This cavalry, I, I mean, it was always going to be the likely way in which this battle was won or lost. All of the Lancers and just various cavalry units on display from both sides, and Arthur Dane once again being bold, although this time all of the pikes are already engaged fighting off against the Arthur Danians on the front line. Now things are a little bit more chaotic though, and there aren't single targets to go after. You would suggest that front line, if there isn't any significant hammer and anvil strike, should have the better of the Arthur Danian equivalent. It's more of a bump than anything else from the Royal Court. How much staying power does all this cavalry have? I mean, the Arthur Danian resilience with all that armour and the shields definitely going to be called into question here. Though I don't think there's actually much in the way of damage that the shields will absorb. Not the javelins, not the melee force either. Arrow block chance alone. Close damage being done as well by the Riddermark skirmishers. Throwing projectiles as much as the Troll Slayers have done a lot of damage. Over the long haul of the battle, you would suggest the throwing projectile advantage is certainly in favour of the red team. Now, the blue team are in a little bit of trouble on this flank. The Rohirrim Horse Archers, joined by the Umbar Heavy Cavalry and the Umbar Axemen, means that the cavalry is going to need to retreat. The Dunedine Troll Slayers are there. Both sides realigned are now compromised. It may be a case of who can get the precision strikes with their cavalry charges best. Huge line there from Arthur Dane, which is just covering the map. We've got him Ladris moving forward. I mean, we certainly back in Ladris in a straight fight in terms of infantry with Rohan, but Rohan haven't been in any great hurry to rush that engagement because they've got other parts of the battlefield where they seem to be doing quite well. Madras Guardians on the charge. Remark Skirmishers on the retreat. I mean, the Madras don't want to chase too far because they don't really have the numbers to be able to withstand any sort of cavalry charges that may arise as a result of that. Dormant Catapult crew ready to move in and be a bit of a block of armour for their team. Javelins filtering in from behind. Remark Skirmishers once again. Let's track a little bit of the Corsair Blackguard, but I think that's because they've been harried by the Arthur Danian cavalry. Over here, Royal Courthouse Armleth trying to help curtail this flanking force, which has started to be a bit of a problem. I mean, the Umbar Axe Guard should get turned back by the Elder Runway Swordmasters, given a bit of time, but it's the resources that are being needed to stop this advance, which may give the Red Team other opportunities. You can see all of those elven units that are over there now trying to spread over here, which may give the Rohirrim on the other side the gap they need. Warlords of Umbar getting involved in a straight melee fight, and Duneline Cavalry will be quite accomplished up close, but it's better to take that fight than allow them to use those throwing axes of theirs. Some scary looking elven cavalry, though, trying to surround further. Corsairs moving forward in numbers to back up the Umbar Axe Guard wave and try and keep this flanking force going for as long as possible. The United Cavalry on the retreat and throwing their axes as they do so. Defenders of Fornos joining the Elder Emway Swordmasters. This is a lot of finesse which the forces of Umbar over on this side of things don't possess but the armor piercing will help but not win the fight for them. Meanwhile, over here, this front line from Umbar has slowly started to win, and a unit of defenders of Fornost is needed to be committed to make sure that this fight remains in a bit of a quagmire. But more of those Umbar pikes. Is that the sort of thing which, come the late stages of the battle, the blue team are going to have an answer for? Because they're having to dump a lot of their resources here to fight a lot of fires throughout the field, and 
comes down to it, in the late game, those Naruna Ari Sentinels would be an insurmountable task, even for the Elven forces in melee because of the range that they possess, now being joined as well by some Rohirrim forces, both Dwarven and Human. And the Arthurian Pikemen having to reposition themselves, try and make a defensive position here. Again, the team that has fallen into a more defensive shape generally has been on the receiving end of a loss here, trying to fall back into a position that they can defend. I mean, it's the right call, it's just been a bit of a trend in the tournament so far. They definitely need to try and make the battlefield smaller as well, because if the cavalry starts to get hammer and anvil strikes, like I said, the smaller nature of the blue team's armies means they can't afford to take huge swathes of damage quickly. I mean, it's not exactly the biggest armies from the red team either. The amount of cavalry that Rohan have means that they are ultimately going to have a smaller force. Umbar bringing the numbers. The warlords have been a significant addition to their forces as well. Interesting the horse arch as well, they've been active for quite a while at this point, doing damage slowly, don't have the kind of blockbuster damage that throwing projectiles tend to have and have done in this battle clearly, but a constant thorn in their side as have been the Eldrenway archers to be fair, I mean they haven't had the easiest shots is the problem, they don't have the same mobility, Hammers is a big unit of quality to be able to bring forward now as all of the Rohan infantry now I mean, this is a sight you don't see too often. The elves scrambling, and the Rohirrim, the ones getting after them with melee infantry. I think getting your infantry in a situation where they're fleeing this far back into the field is probably not ideal, because they're still fighting on the front line, and it's too far away, really. They have drawn the Rohirrim back, and they should beat the West Marks in this sort of engagement, but the true prize, I think, for the red team will be crushing the resistance of this central force with this strong point of infantry. They've got enough pikes and spears that even if the blue team win out with some cavalry, they can weather that storm, I think. Throwing projectiles are going to be more significant later on. The slow burn of archer damage is not going to suffice. God Helene getting hit as well. It's a chaotic fight, this, but it's happening within a reasonably small space of the field. The Umbar cavalry has been resilient. And I don't know who it was more important to win the cavalry fight. Neither side has been utterly dominant in it. Both sides have scored some good charges, done some good defensive work. It might just be a case of the red team having more left in the tank with their numbers here. And also the overall level of quality is not poor. That elven army... Of it does have... Ladris Guardians winning on the flank against the Umbar Pikes. Rangers of Castamere have been doing damage slowly over time. Two units of them is an expensive thing for Waffles to have brought. Knights of Anunas getting chased by the Sons of Yorl, though. Still 22 of them remain. Some trebuch trebuchet crew over on this flank. I mean, they won't win this fight, but they will delay the ultimately victorious infantry. But that flanking force from the red team, I would suggest, did its job. More resources got committed to stop it. And then you can see the shape of the engagement as the red team have wrapped around. I guess the question now is whether it's going to be largely based on whether the Rohirrim infantry, I think, have the staying power or not. The Lords of Umbar getting a rear charge into the Arthurian Pikemen, routing over 90 pikes at this stage in proceedings feels like a really significant thing. They need those numbers. They can't afford to be losing that kind of force and throwing projectiles doing the business. Yeah, they don't have the numbers here to staunch the bleeding at this point, the blue team. A few scattered remains of units on the front line. There's still the elven calf, but the red team have the calf to match them. And they have far more of an infantry presence now. The Lydra's Guardians will fight to the bitter end. They have been joined by defenders of Fornos, so they do still have some strong points. The elven general fall into the Rohirrim infantry, who... Yes, the ground was set well for them, and it wasn't an overwhelming elven force, but Rohan have done well against Imladris with infantry on this occasion, which has not been the case for a while. Certainly in the last version of the game, Rohan's infantry left a lot to be desired, but we've seen aspects of them to enjoy here. Certainly it was augmented by the fact that their cavalry has been doing the business as well. That double act 
will be key to them, certainly on a field battle, but I think also in a siege we're likely to see that sort of dynamic play out as well. Elven units way in the backfield here, who did draw the Rohirrim back, but I don't think that really panned out the way that Alexios would have been hoping. And of course this, with the situation being what it is, Lancers, no real way back for the blue team at this point, it would be a remarkable thing. But the rank one team fall in the semi-finals been pretty much impervious up until this point in the tournament but a very very good victory here by the Reds Rohan and Umbar Umbar as well solid front line the quality of the Elves and Arthur Dane's support was always going to be a little bit daunting but Umbar do have qualities of their own and that Pike force despite taking a bit of damage early on was able to hold firm the centre held and the flanks did their job, and that's all you can really say for the red team. And again, both sides kind of dance towards one another, neither side being super aggressive, but the side that had to fall into more defensive shape has gone on to lose here, and a good victory as well. Like I said, you can't really blame the blue team for that, though. They didn't have the numbers, they didn't have a choice. I mean, the alternative would have been a suicidal charge. So you have to set the set the scene well. And that's something that the red team was certainly able to do here. Little remains of the Elder Runway archers. Hunted down by the Rohirrim shield maidens. Going to throw some throwing axes in and I'd be surprised if that didn't result yeah, and they rout. <laughs> the elves of course having lost their general. We didn't see the Arthurdain general fall actually, not yet. We may see him. I don't know where he's vanished to, is he over here? in this mess. Uh, no, those are Elven units there. Well, that is going to be that. This is a drop to the Arthur Dane General will escape the field, but their team will not escape this fixture. It's still in the tournament. And there we have it. Waffles and Tundra's Fox advancing to the grand final. And yeah, that was a good competitive match. Again, it's how you set the scene, really. And I think... I kind of got the sense early on, I mean, to be fair, I did actually know the result of this battle before going into it. I was actually sent it by both teams. In the end, I decided not to show it from Waffles' perspective, just to uh, try and psych people out a little bit, because people often kind of get the impression that we only ever see battles from the perspective of victorious teams, which, not so much in the tournament, I have to say, because we have seen the opposite, but in general, that is a rule which does apply about eight times, nine times out of ten. I decided to go the other way around on this occasion. So I did know the result going in, um, but just based on the compositions, I do think that the red team had more of a comfortable feel to their army. Yes, it's a lot of cavalry, which does come with its own difficulties, but Rohan are built as a faction to be able to do that. I think the Arthur Dane army had the cavalry. They can also go about things in that way, especially seeing as they went for no archers. Um, it's, it's something else that they can really go for, a solid front line, and then combined with the support of something else, it's the Imladris army that I'm looking at and thinking it's, it was probably a little bit risky to go for that. I mean, elves do have quality, and I mean, it wasn't you know, that big a margin. It certainly could have worked out for them, but going for that many archers, a slower burn kind of unit on an open field, yes, the elven archers, especially those elven archers, are going to be very strong in melee as well, so maybe that was the thinking, but they're very expensive, and ultimately the size of the army combined with the types of units that they had I don't know. I feel like it was... If they were going to go for this sort of approach, I think Arthur Dane probably could have traded in one of their cavalry units, maybe for some artillery of their own. Then they would have been able to push and pull the red team around early, like they have done in previous battles up till now. The other thing that could have been an idea was for the elves to go more infantry-focused, um, maybe try and go for... I mean, horse archers is probably not going to work out against Rohan, but maybe go for some more defensive Arthur Danian archers instead and then go for a little bit more quality around the elven, or more numbers anyway, around the elven infantry. You know, maybe go for some of those standard ones, but, you know, the, this is splitting hairs, really. This composition could have worked, it just ended up not being the case in the end. I mean, the red team didn't have things all their own way, after all, the artillery fight probably didn't go as well for them as they would have liked, but it went well enough, and they had the safety net of those extra numbers from Umbar um, in the infantry fight, and, uh, yeah, let's see what did the damage for him, Ladris, though, I mean... The Ballista, most of the good work it did was, of course, not killing off enemy units, but killing off enemy artillery pieces. 
Gwythi Rockdor did a lot of damage uh, scurrying around the field, which isn't too surprising. I feel like we'd probably see similar numbers from the other heavy-hitting cavalry units on display today, like all of the Lance cavalry, really, the Knights of Anuminus, the Warlords of Umbar, and the Sons of Aeol. We saw all of them doing good work, um, and the Gwythi Rockdor, no exception. The Lance is doing pretty well also. Eldrin Way Sword Bastards did very well on the flank against the initial Umbar flank, but by the time they got involved in the other engagements, things had already gone a little bit sour for them. Um, and yeah, Eldrin Way Archers, 98, 107. It's not terrible, but the thing is, a fair few of those kills would have been in melee, and for a unit that expensive, is it worth it? Again, going double Eldrin Way in most of these cases as well, it's expensive, it can work, didn't quite on this occasion. Um, and yeah, commiserations to Alexios22 and Batu, who have actually been um, the tournament's primary organisers as well, so they've done very well up to this point, but now they fall just before they were able to even undertake the final hurdle in the grand final. But we'll see how Waffles and Tundra's Fox get on. Hopefully I will be able to show the other semi-final decider as well, and then we will of course move on to the grand final. I don't know if there's plans for a third place playoff, maybe there is. Um, in which case, this won't be the last we've seen of Alexios and Batu, because they will have to contest that. Um, but yeah, we shall see. Big thank you to both teams, actually, for sending this replay in, specifically Alexios and Waffles. Big thank you as well to all of the players for keeping this one, or keeping this tournament going. We're into the final stages now. Um, and yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.